My name is Elizabeth Minchin. I'm the Professor of Classics here at the ANU, and I welcome you all very warmly on this very bitter evening to this special lecture in support of the uh, uh, Classics Endowment Fund. In this gathering, there may be people who aren't aware of the Classics Endowment Fund, so I'd like to set out very briefly what it is what it does, and what we hope it will do. The Classics Endowment came into being only three years ago, in an era in which funding for universities in general, and for certain areas of research, uh, and certain, and sorry, <laughs> funding for universities in general, and for certain areas of research and teaching within universities, has been severely restricted. This is a fund, the Classics Endowment Fund, not just for the present, but for the future. The Classics Fund is an endowed fund within the ANU Endowment for Excellence. Invested in perpetuity, it earns interest annually, and it is this interest that is used to support the study of classics and ancient history at the ANU in a variety of ways. At present, thanks to the Classics Endowment, we're able to offer annual prizes and awards for students in both the classical languages, ancient history and Latin, and in ancient history. And only recently, we were able to appoint a very part-time curatorial assistant who will support our work in the Classics Museum, the Classics Library, and in our extensive outreach activities as we bring ancient world scholars and specialists to, Canberra, to the Canberra community to talk about their research. But we want to do more. We want to be able to offer student scholarships, especially for honours students and for PhD students. We want to be able to offer some financial support to our undergraduate students who undertake, or who would like to undertake, the richly rewarding overseas study courses that we now offer each January. We want to be able to support the research activities of both staff members and our postgraduate students. And ultimately, and this is a distant dream, I know, we want to be able to fund additional positions in classics and ancient history so that we can offer a wider program of courses to our students than we're able to do at present. With the support of the Classics Endowment, we want to ensure that students at the ANU who wish to pursue their passion for the classical world will always have the best possible environment in which to do so. So far, I've spoken about the Classics Endowment as an it. Uh, it was established, it is invested, it earns at annual interest, and so on. But I actually prefer to think of the Classics Endowment in human terms. For me, the Classics Endowment is the sum of all those people, including many of you in the hall this evening, who have contributed to the fund so far people whom we know and people whom we don't. We are enormously grateful to all those who believe that what we do is important and that it deserves support. There are donation cards on your seats this evening. Please take one away with you and think about how you might support the future of ancient world studies at the ANU. I should add, that some of the principal beneficiaries of the endowment are also here with us tonight. Our students, many of whom are quite recognisable in their striking black t-shirts. These young people are bright, they're keen and they're committed. Please talk to them after the lecture. They are our best ambassadors. At this point, I'm going to hand over the floor to my colleague, the convener of the Classics and Ancient History program, Dr. Peter Lundy. Peter will say something about the importance of the study of classics, and he will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you. That's a bit of a tall order to say how important classics is, uh, given that I was told I can only speak for three minutes or something. Uh, 
Look, tomorrow when I am talking to students at the ANU's Open Day about why I think they should do a Bachelor of Classical Studies, I'll probably open with a quotation from the late Steve Jobs, who 10 years ago uh, said, I would trade all my technology for an afternoon with Socrates. Uh, now, I don't want to be an Apple fanboy, but if Steve Jobs said it, then it obviously has something going for it. And I think it is amazing that somebody who was so much at the cutting edge of modern technology equally realised the importance, perhaps even the greater importance, of understanding the deep human past of the ancient Greek and Roman world. And that's, he was right, obviously, because the classical world of Greeks and Romans underlie a huge amount of how we today think about the world. How there is a modern tendency to see education as a form of training, training for a job, training to be a cog in the economic machine. And with that, that view does not lead to subjects like classics and ancient history being terribly much in favour these days. But if we see education, as I think we should, as a training for life, a training to be a citizen, something which uh, a means towards an enriched understanding of life which can make one a better human being, then there is no better education available than education in classics and ancient history. When our students come face to face with ancient Greeks and Romans, in some ways they meet people who are amazingly like ourselves, and in other ways they meet people who have a completely different way of looking at the world from ourselves. So there's both similarity and difference all wrapped up there. They study these civilizations not as narrow specialists, but in the round. They study the history, the languages, the literature, the art, the archaeology, the philosophy, if they're lucky, uh, the economics, social life, a whole range of things which give them an amazing insight into how these different but very important civilizations worked. I believe this is a wonderful education, whatever our students go on to do afterwards. But it's not one that fits in with modern ideas about how you run a university financially, which is why we have the Classics Endowment Fund, which Elizabeth has talked about. Uh, this fund helps us maintain and will help us maintain and enhance the study of the classical world at the ANU in all sorts of areas, in teaching, in research, and an outreach. Outreach, which is a word which really only university administrators should use, I think, means you people. And we have a wonderful group of people in the community who are very vibrantly interested in our subject. Uh, we have lots of lectures with our friends of the Classics Museum and friends of the Australian Archaeological Institute in Athens and nights like tonight. And we have a big community audience which is interested in the subject and which shares it with us. We're very lucky through the fund now to have wonderful Fiona Sweet Formiati working a few hours a week for us, helping us keep that sort of outreach going so that those things will keep on happening in the future. Teaching is very, very important to us. Uh, we have, we're really blessed with a very enthusiastic bunch of students who are doing this subject because they love it and who I think are gaining a lot, from, a lot from doing it. And as Elizabeth said, I really hope that you will take the chance after the lecture to talk to some of the students wandering around in black t-shirts with sort of a Homeric warrior on the front. Uh, because as Elizabeth said, they're our best advertisement. And I really want you to get the chance to feel the immense enthusiasm that those students have for our subject. I've had the privilege of going on a couple of the overseas courses that we run now to, to Turkey and to Greece and seeing firsthand the tremendous enthusiasm that the students have when they've been studying a subject for years uh, and suddenly they're confronted with the ancient sites. They actually are walking on the places where ancient Greeks and Romans lived, thought, wrote, uh, left pieces of pottery lying around on the ground where they can still be picked up today. Uh, that, I think open students' minds to what is going on in the ancient world in a, an amazing way which you can't just get from books. So one of the things we really do hope to do with the endowment fund is to make it financially easier for students to go on those courses. They are immensely valuable courses for them. And research is really important. Uh, and it's really important that we support research. 
classic, classicists are not sort of keepers, just keepers of some set of arcane law. We are engaged in a very rich and vibrant area of study where we are constantly enriching our understanding of the ancient world. And in doing that, we're not just enriching our understanding of the ancient world, but also of human life in general, which really brings me to tonight's lecture as an excellent example of this. Uh, Han Bouterson is working on an ARC-funded project looking at uh, perspectives, and I'll give you the title of the project, uh, Grief and Consolations in the Ancient World and Beyond. So looking at the ancient world, but also in the context of later periods of uh, human culture and civilization. Looking at both ancient and modern perspectives on, in this case, a universal human experience, that of grief. And I think this is a wonderful example of how the study of civilizations of 2,000 or more years ago remains absolutely vitally relevant to us today. Professor Han Bouterson is from the Netherlands. Uh, he studied at the University of Utrecht. And possibly after wandering by chance into ancient philosophy, he started off as a, sort of a classicist, uh, studying Greek, Latin, ancient history and so forth. But he got into ancient philosophy and did his PhD on Theophrastus and the transmission of pre-Socratic thought. Since then, he's held positions in Utrecht and at King's College London before, in 2002, coming to Australia to a position at the University of Adelaide, where he is now the Hughes Professor of Classics. Han has published many works on ancient philosophy and also been involved in what is even more important to university administrators today than publishing major research grants, including the one on grief, which uh, we'll hear some of the fruits of tonight. His topic tonight uh, is how to console oneself and others, Ancient and Modern Perspectives on Managing Grief, and I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Professor Han Bowson to speak to us. Well, it's a wonderful thing to see so many people come at a time that the weather is really not inviting, and I hope that tonight I can give you some example of the work that I'm doing. I'm very pleased to have been invited. So Elizabeth and Peter, thank you very much. And uh, it was very good to see an old friend tonight, Yasu Yanis. And um, I'll be launching straight in, if you don't mind. What I will first do is tell you um, that the lecture is part of an ARC project and that it is incumbent upon me to report that to you because um, that's why I like to have this opportunity. Work that is ARC funded is after all partly coming out of tax dollars and there's nothing I like more than to let people know what the fruits of one's work and one's thinking about these topics is. So let me go ahead. Some initial thoughts. When Emily Dickinson, in one of her letters, wrote, that bareheaded life under the grass worries one like a wasp. She expressed a general human worry about what happens to us after death. Such is our plight. We are aware of our mortality and anticipate it. The need for grief expression in words is apparent across history and different cultures. In the past 50 years or so, the modern study of grief in the 20th century, and more recently on the ancient world, has intensified considerably. Different views have been put forward to explain this. The rise of social sciences, secularization, and the need for guidance in ritual, the Second World War, and its subsequent age of anxiety accompanied by the rise of Prozac. <coughs> All these factors may have played a role, but my project has taken its cue primarily for more recent changes in public grief expression and, in the context of resolving mental disorders, the increasing critique of medicinal approaches leading to a use of the arts in resolving grief. Like retirement, death is a topic most of us prefer to deal with later. 
And with increased longevity, this is perhaps a luxury we can afford. But unlike retirement, death has a way of imposing itself more frequently, disrupting our daily routines when family and friends are taken. As ABC broadcaster linguist Ruth Wienrock commented a few years ago, we live with disturbing uncertainties. And from one moment to the next, everything can turn around. You change lanes at the bad moment, and there goes your spine. You have a biopsy and await the result, and then you have to rethink your life expectancy. The stock market dissolves your super. A cyclone sweeps away your home, family, community. Life, as you know it, is tenuous at best. End of quote. Yet, unless disproportionately unfortunate, we lack enough familiarity with the subject to get used to it or be prepared for a new mishap. In modern testimonies, one may quote the well-known example from C.S. Lewis. No one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. Or Joan Didion's memoir, The Year of Magical Thinking, grief, when it comes, is nothing we expect it to be. Such comments can easily be paralleled with ancient ones, which express dismay at how hard it is to find words in dealing with grief. Usually, shock, despair, and being at a loss for words. These brief sound bites stand for a range of remarkable documents that chart a constant concern for coping with sorrow by way of a literary response. They encapsulate the humanistic value that contain, continues to evoke a strong reaction of recognition and sympathy long after they were produced. Consolation and grief management is a fascinating subject at the core of what the humanities deal with. Human experience, how it is expressed in the miracle of language, and what we might learn from it. So here is the list that I've been studying, but this is a selection. We have a whole range of texts that could be looked at in antiquity that express some form of response to loss. And later on I will be concentrating on Cicero and Plutarch. So, in other words, my focus here is not on loss per se, but on what we can do to cope with it. The term grief management is, of course, a modern one, but it does essentially apply, in many cases, to ancient material. And here's an example of some of the ancient testimonies. Cicero says, I'm writing to you after his daughter has died, but I have nothing to say. So he's immediately contradicting himself. But the point is, he has to write, he has to talk, he has to share. And that's a very interesting sort of universal response. Seneca writes in one of his tragedies, there's no limit to weeping, Cassandra, because what we are suffering has vanquished the limit itself. The difficulty of dealing with it. And Jerome, in a consoling letter to Heliodorus, writes, the greater a subject is, the more completely a person is overwhelmed, cannot find words to unfold his grandeur. The ancients knew about loss in as many forms as we do. Loss of a child, parents, pets, property, dignity, one's country. It is said that Alexander the Great was inconsolable over the death of his horse. That Cicero bemoaned his exile, as did the poet of it. Cicero, sorry, this went a bit too quick. Cicero in the middle there. And the doctor Galen, in the second century, needed all his composure to cope with the loss of his carefully collected store of medication, recipes, as well as quite a few of his writings after a fire in Rome in 92 CD. <clears throat> so the struggle to contain emotions by rational means is as old as human documents allow us to trace. Thanks to a range of surviving written sources, we know that humans have long found the need to express their grief, or as Shakespeare put it, to give sorrow words. But in addition, they have pursued ways to use language as the cure. This centrality of language is at the core of my project, how reading and writing can assist in coping with grief. This topic, then, is about human experience and takes a deliberate interest in the subjective. 
Since the Enlightenment, Western culture has attempted to create an objective science of the subjective. But even Isaac Newton, from 1642 to 1727, understood that science only covers certain aspects of reality when he wrote, I can calculate the motions of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of crowds. In the 19th century, Leo Tolstoy proclaimed, science does not tell us how to live. Here I simply assume that the subjective plays an important role in our lives and that rational analysis of literary sources, ancient and modern, can provide insight into the trends, importance and the value of emotional responses to difficult circumstances. The similarities between ancient and modern responses to grief can be exploited, I believe, by trying to answer questions these similarities provoke. How did they manage grief and sorrow? Has this changed over time? Can we learn anything from the document that offer consoling thoughts and strategies given that they are dealing with the universal and defining marker of humanity? To answer these and other questions, I had to venture into unknown territory, to cross disciplinary boundaries, read up on modern theories, and observe contemporary events. One of my findings, I think, is that something seems to have been lost in modern times, which was still with us up until the early modern period. In the early 17th century, for instance, authors were still familiar with Plutarch's ideas on the therapeutic use of reading. Thus, Philemon Holland, when translating the work Moralia of Plutarch, and commenting on how young men may take profit from reading poems, said, the young man must enter his own heart and examine himself when he is alone, how he was moved and affected, whether he find any turbulent passions of his mind, thereby dulced and appeased, whether any grief or heaviness that trouble him be mitigated and assuaged. So in what follows, I will highlight one particular thread of my wider project on grief, in two sections and a brief conclusion. In part one, I will discuss the benefits of a comparative approach by applying modern tools ancient sources. In part two, I will clarify the nature of the ancient consolation genre, in particular its universal features, in the hope that this increases our appreciation of the wisdom of those who lived before us. Cicero famously said that those who do not know their history will remain their children. In other words, he is suggesting that historical awareness is about maturity, and that one should build on the past to understand the present and contribute to the future. In the case of grief, we have an opportunity to tap into a reservoir of human experience that transcends the historical gap and helps to encounter, or sorry, to counter, in C.S. Lewis's phrase, chronological snobbery, which regards historical material inherently inferior. Our primary aim is to consider how we gain a proper understanding of these expressions of grief and loss. So I'll start my part one in talking about ancient emotions benefiting from some comparative approach. Modern grief studies show the subjective element of the emotional responses affect self-assessment and how emotions are moving targets. As we will see in two case studies in section two, this applies to the understanding of bereavement. Modern grief studies based on empirical research, and I emphasize empirical here, are only 60 years old, and recent debate over the best methods has made for something of a hot topic. The first empirical research project into acute grief in the, is in the famous Lindemann study, 1944, showed the great variety of symptoms and responses to grief, thereby breaking with the attitude of the stiff upper lip or the advice to just get on with it. Further work in the 1960s, 70s and 80s um, by Bowlby on the mother-child attachment showed its importance on the impact of these uh, attachments to later life. Incidentally, in reading these materials and some later works, I was quite surprised to learn that Freud had fewer and fewer friends among psychologists, so much so that his name seems to have become a sort of a new F word.
The benefits of a comparative approach for a study of grief are considerable. New methodological perspectives and hindsight are always a useful part of historical analysis, if used correctly. But modern methods and concepts assist in gaining greater clarity on meaning, context, and development of the topic. They help us recast certain interpretations that further illuminate texts in ways that are not literary. Here I am not merely following the influence of social sciences upon historical studies since the 1960s, but also specifically the growing debate outside academia on the nature of emotions. In the public sphere, I'm thinking, for instance, of the appearance of a range of self-disclosure documents, memoirs, perhaps one could call them, that reflect on the loss of an intimate. So here we have a number of examples, and I've just, again, just taken out a few. We've got C.S. Lewis, John Didion, so death of his wife, death of the husband, death of the husband, sorry, of the mother. This is about the death of the husband in the Twin Towers, and this is the death of his mother. This is Susan Sontag's son. This is only a little kind of selection from the last 40 years or so. What we have here are not diaries with sentimental outpourings of emotions, but well-crafted accounts of grief. That there was a real increase of these in the past decades, it's not just my perception, but it's also clear from Jeffrey Berman's story. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong button again. Um, who, who published the book Companionship in Grief, Love and Loss in the Memoirs of, and here you have at least two of these the ones that I just mentioned to you. But we should not overlook the public responses to a number of events in more recent times. For instance, to Princess Diana's death, the war in Iraq, and the September 11 attack on the World Trade Center. In the US, President Bush was accused of not knowing why mourning is appropriate. These factors have triggered a broader public awareness of the importance of dealing with grief. Earl Spencer's speech at Diana's funeral was not only a well-planned emotional eulogy, but quite a subtle and subversive critique of the press and of the royal family. And let me quote you a little bit from the speech of September 6, 1997. It was quite emotive. We all remember the moment and the kind of clatter of the applause that rose outside of the building. This is what he wrote, amongst other things. Diana was the very essence of compassion, of duty, of style, of beauty. She was a symbol of selfless humanity, a standard bearer for the rights of the truly downtrodden, a very British girl who transcended nationality, someone with natural nobility, who was classless. My reading is a little bit over-emphatic to make a certain point here. In this emotive praise of the people's princess, as Blair called her, Spencer combines a eulogy for her character with implicit criticism of the royal family's German background, lack of compassion, and inherited nobility. There is good reason to believe that the death of Princess Diana prepared the way for public emotional outpouring. With her death, something unprecedented occurred, and things have changed permanently. Ancient parallels exist for cases like these. Julius Caesar's funeral in 44 BC generated a lot of public interest, as well as anger at his assassins as a result of Mark Antony's provocative funeral speech. In 1980, the very popular grandson of Augustus and designated heir of Tiberius Germanicus died unexpectedly under suspicious circumstances. His death caused a huge public display of mourning in Rome and the Empire. The account in Tacitus shows how important eulogy was in honor of his memory, especially by implying how he was the exact opposite of Tiberius. His funeral was honored by panegyrics and a commemoration of his virtues. Some, thinking of his beauty, his age, likened his end to that of Alexander the Great. Both had a graceful person who had a noble birth and died in a foreign place. But 
Germanicus is gracious to his friends, temperate in his pleasures, the husband of one wife, and with only legitimate children. Let me give one more contemporary example, and I'm very pleased to connect up with something that Peter just said earlier. So just to drive home this point on the way which, in which public tributes play out in different cultures. As soon as the death of Apple's CEO, Steve Jobs, became public, Apple was flooded with tributes and condolences. It seems curious that a businessman's passing would generate such a worldwide response of grief and sorrow. The most striking and typically 20th century aspect of this, I think, was the role of the so-called social media in generating attention and tributes. This was even more important for the truly iconic tribute by a Hong Kong graphic designer, which went viral on the internet. I'm not sure if you know this picture, but I have this on my office door because I think it's brilliant. What he did is, in an ingenious way, create a tribute via both the Apple logo and the Jobs silhouette, thereby also signifying Jobs' permanent absence, by incorporating this in the bite of the Apple. It's permanent absence of its present. So that's a very clever job. What we have here, then, in modern terms, is the attempt at the memorialization of the deceased an age-old convention already found in ancient Greece and Rome. Of course, the case of Steve Jobs is also atypical because of the emotional investment users now make into Apple products, a feeling which they seem to have redirected back at him and his death. One American commentator wryly noted, and Harry Potter fans may find this amusing, that Apple products can be viewed as Steve Jobs' horcruxes, which contain little part of his spirit or soul. One hopes, of course, that the parallel with Voldemort ends there. <laughs> Among current theories of grief management, we find emphasis on the great variety of ways in which people may mourn, which is less so in antiquity. The idea that grief may escalate into a morbid state of depression or worse, so-called complicated grief. Again, this was not recognized in antiquity, although there are certain descriptions in medical sources. And the ways in which grief lingers are suppressed by social pressures. When death is unexpected, the experience of grief is usually worse. But anticipated grief, a concept that was known in antiquity, is only marginally different. Now one interesting result from modern research, with no exact parallel in the ancient world, is the way in which grief can, has been looked at from an evolutionary point of view as being normal for all animals, including non-human animals, both as grief in animals and as grief for animals, your pets. And not so long ago, there was a very famous case that also went viral about a cross-species consolation, whereby the dog had had an accident and the orangutan was brought in, had been um, bereaved because his parents had been killed, and they then consoled each other. They are now um, inseparable. This is not completely new. I already mentioned the case of Alexander and his horse. In the case of Achilles, we are told, and we can believe it, that these horses mourned for their driver when he died, Patroclus. But we also have from antiquity a number of poems in which masters pine after their pets. The irony is that these recent trends have begun to attack the clinical and medicalized approaches which have been on the rise throughout the 20th century. On a very recent study by Horowitz and Wakefield, entitled The Loss of Sadness, argues that the psychological profession has gone too far in medicalization of depression and grief is considered a special case of depression. Their specific aim is to criticize the use of standard diagnostic criteria in the so-called DSM-5, the Handbook for Psychological Disorder, when, which they believe has led to an overgenerous definition of depression 
and hence causes normal sadness to be declared depression. In grief, then, we have a special case of that. This is where it gets interesting for my purposes. At the same time that these professional studies in psychiatry are advocating non-medical approaches to depression and grief, new possible alternatives are being trialed, which include various activities originating in the arts. A pioneering collection from 1999, edited by Chris Burton, could play a role, sorry, uh, has led the way in looking at how drama, film, writing and reading prose or poetry could play a role in grief work. So let me illustrate what kind of texts I've looked at before making the case for aligning this with the Bertman approach. For a long time, the ancients had little to assist themselves in times of distress, apart from rituals, music, and lament. I'm going to omit for this current purposes a curious incident of a medicinal cure, which we hear about in Homer's Odyssey, Book 4, where Helen creates a potion presented to her husband Menelaus and her guest Telemachus, who are struck by a bout of grief, thinking about the war in Troy and the loss of his father, at least he still thinks his father is lost. It's a special concoction which is called grief assuaging, nepenthes. When did this change, this use of lament and ritual and music? The earliest example I've traced for the expression of grief can be found in the Gilgamesh epic some 4,000 years ago. When the arrogant King Gilgamesh loses his dear friend and alter ego, Enkidu. Oh, hear me, O oh elders of Uruk. I mourn for Enkidu, my friend. I shriek in anguish like a mourner. After you die, I let a filthy mat of hair grow over my body and don the skin of lion and roam the wilderness. These symptoms of despair, self neglect, and restlessness expressed here look all too familiar. But note that there is no internalized self-analysis or self-directive consolation. The grief is played out through lament and action and only fades after the king has gone through some of the grief stages which we would now associate with the famous model of Cooper Ross. Now anger, rather than depression, acceptance. A thousand years later, we find Achilles in a similar emotional state when his friend, Patroclus, dies. This time the situation is slightly more complicated. Achilles has been boycotting the war effort. Patroclus proposes to go to battle in his place, and Achilles lets him and lends him his armor. This engenders a sense of guilt, which complicates his grief. A black cloud of grief came shrouding over Achilles, both hands clawing the ground for soot and filth. He poured it over his head, fouled his handsome face, and black ashes settled into his fresh, clean war shirt. Overpowered at all this power, sprawled in the dust, Achilles lay there fallen, tearing his hair out, defiling with his own hands. Antilochus bent over him a while, weeping, and holding both his hands as he lay groaning for the fear, for he feared that he might plunge a knife into his own throat. Then Achilles gave a loud cry. Achilles' behavior is that of women mourners, but more extremely, and so much so that it frightens his companion who interprets it as potentially suicidal. In this case, we can see how he is brought down by the powerful mix of several emotions. Pride, guilt, and grief. The classical commentary on the Iliad by Walter Leaf, admittedly written when textual criticism dominated scholarship, focuses mostly on conventional literary and linguistic analysis, so grammar, morphology, and so on, saying things like, the word clean in clean war shirt translates to peculiar Greek words, nektaroi, which probably means for your days, nice smelling, since herbs were used to preserve garments, dot, 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 and the cloak may be a present from Thetis, this model. Leaf is, of course, not primarily interested in ancient fabric softeners, but in determining the correct text 
and explaining word meaning, currents, and origin. I believe it would be more helpful to psychologize a little bit and enrich our reading to a more rewarding insight into the emotive effect of such a passage, provided it is viewed within the wider development of attitudes and responses to grief at the time. Now, these cases can be further illustrated if we move slightly further down in time to the 5th century BC Athens to find examples of grief strategies which exploit rhetorical techniques. <coughs> Their major difference compared to Gilgamesh and the Iliad is that these are rational approaches to grief, aiming for a deliberate effect of consolation with the help of persuasion. It's no longer just about mourning and self-pity, but these search for the right word or turn of phrase to change the outlook or lead the mood of the addressee. The earliest evidence for this therapeutic turn, as I like to call it, comes from the mid-5th century. The sophist Antiphon, the teacher of rhetoric, is said to have offered sessions in which, according to two sources, he said, is said to have composed tragedies to himself, by himself and with the tyrant Dionysius. While he was still involved in poetry, he designed a method for the cure of grief on the analogy of the treatment of the sick by doctors. And getting himself a dwelling in Corinth near the marketplace, he advertised and was able to cure those suffering from grief through the power of the word, the words, and discovering the causes of their sickness by inquiry and gave consolation to sufferers. It is striking how Antiphon's interest in poetry is brought into connection with rhetorical skills and knowledge of causes. A second passage points also to his power to drive out grief with the use of words. Antiphon developed great powers of persuasion and he announced a course on grief assuaging lectures. And he uses the same word, by the way, the author who described this as the word we just mentioned of Helen's potion asserting that no one would tell him a grief so terrible that he could not root it out of the mind. So, hereafter, it is just not simply ritual, but also reason that deals with the emotions, especially when it comes to consolatory writing. Philosophical views would begin to dominate ways of thinking, but while their influence has been studied in great detail, their efficacy has not. In part two, I will look at two cases with philosophical influence clear in one and absent in the other. Here's the link that I wanted to make between these two comments here. But, uh, antiphon. So whatever the writer was trying to do, he was trying to make this link between Odyssey and Antiphon. Part two. Brief writings and readings. Grief writing was, and still is, an accepted way to deal with times of trouble. It is an ancient Greek tradition to see the treatment of psychological problems as analogous to physical problems. Plato also alluded to the possible use of the word in influencing the mind. In one of his works, he speaks about psychagogia, the leading of the mind. You can influence the mind through the word. This is, of course, an attempt to make more visible and concrete what is invisible and difficult to control. Another problem for Greeks and Romans was how to guard oneself against such contingencies as the loss of life, of health, of material possessions. This was as pressing in antiquity as it is today, although our lives are more secure than those of Greeks and Romans. Offering consolation is an act of empathy and is always embedded within a belief system, philosophical, religious, social, and necessary to cope with the prospect of a short life and the experience of losing someone close. The ubiquity of death and disease made loss a permanent factor of their lives. My first short case study is about Cicero. Cicero was ill prepared for what fate had in store for him. The politician and orator, he lived in the tumultuous last days of the Republic. We know about his brief responses from three types of documents, but only one has been studied in greater depth. I propose that we can improve understanding and appreciation of Cicero's predicament by including all three types of his writing as part of this grief work, provided we take note of the modern convention of viewing grief as a process. 
This allows us to identify grave stages and take self-consolation more seriously in the process of healing. So the first stage, usually referred to as acute grief, can be lined up with Cicero's letters to his friends, and especially his friend Atticus. The second stage, Greek work, usually secondary response, in which he moves from lament and lethargy to grief work, as it would be called nowadays, is reflected in his consolation to himself, which unfortunately survives only in fragments. And finally, there's the reflective third stage, in which he tries to describe, in more philosophical terms, how grief can be placed within a wider framework of emotions. This he did in a work called Tusculum Debates or Disputations. Now these discussions that were named after the place that it was supposedly taking place, the Tusculum, and they are dialogues in imitation of Plato. What was his predicament? Cicero lost his daughter just after she had given birth in February 45 BC. He was plunged into a period of grief which lasted several months, as is clear from his letters to Atticus. He had lost his public status due to political turmoil, his wife due to divorce, and now his beloved only child. In other words, he had lost his pride in his work as a politician and a safe haven of his family home. The loss of his daughter tipped him over the edge and landed him in a depression. An earlier study and my own findings confirm that his symptoms fit the type of grief nowadays called pathological or abnormal. In one letter he writes, For after trying everything, I have nothing in which I find peace. For while I dealt with that, but which I had written to you before, I, as it were, fostered my pain. Now I reject everything and find nothing to be more bearable than solitude. These letters give us invaluable insight into Cicero's darkest moments of despair, revealed to a much trusted friend. In breach of the social code of his time and class, Cicero admits that he is inconsolable, and even that he is fostering his grief. He has withdrawn from Rome's political scene to stay in the country. Cicero's special situation and resulting isolation explain his responses to the agony of grief. He has to figure out a way himself and does so first by reading and next by writing. But these are not random scribblings. After a telling silence of some weeks, Cicero gets going, does research, and involves Atticus in finding materials. So we have a comment that he makes in one of the letters that reveals what he was doing. Every word that has been written by anyone on the subject of persuading grief I read at your house. He was staying in his house and he had a good library. But my sorrow is beyond any consolation. Now, even if we admit that Cicero has a tendency for exaggeration, I would be willing to give him a little bit of slack here because this is not an average situation. This is not a political speech where he's, you know, firing all syllables. So, then he reveals his purpose. He has written a self-consolation. The response I'm just going to quickly compare it with is Joan Didion's response when she had her husband suddenly die. And she says what she was doing. She's a, she's a writer. I was taught from childhood to go to the literature in time of trouble, so I read everything I could get my hands on about grief. Memoirs, novels, how-to books, inspirational tomes, the Merck manual. Nothing I read but grief seemed to exactly express the craziness of it. Her approaches were slightly different and more idiosyncratic, but you can see the parallel, isn't it? Remarkably, Cicero the orator has somehow addressed himself and made an effort to cope with his loss. The use of persuasion or encouragement, based on a strong belief in the therapeutic value of the word, is to be expected. The addressee is asked to reconceptualize the situation, that is to re-evaluate his views on the circumstances or events which led to the emotional state under consideration. In essence, this is actually not far removed from recent modern approaches to anxiety, distress and bereavement called cognitive behavioral therapy. In this method, 
patients are also encouraged to reconsider their interpretation of circumstances or events and to change their perspective by imagining different outcomes, scenarios, if you like. In particular, the preferred outcome. In modern terms, Cicero is... Sorry, this is the last slide, sorry. It should be um, when he's writing his own consolation to himself. And Cicero is relearning the world, which is the central theme of this book from okay, a few years ago. I can't go into this, but this is a very fascinating book. Um, now, this tripartite model of explanation for Cicero allows us to try and unearth Cicero's emotional state of mind in pragmatic terms, not in terms of theoretical ideals. How he has moved on from his terrible personal tragedy can hardly be retrieved from his stylized philosophical account written months after his acute grief. Our renewed attention to the value of emotions, not only in our own psychic lives, but also in ancient belief systems, encourages such an approach. The remarkable neglect of Cicero's letters may be caused by the fact that most readers found his laments and cries of woe rather painful and embarrassing, and in stark contrast to his noble image as orator or politician. This tradition may even have started its way back in 1354, when Petrarch rediscovered the letters to Atticus and was appalled at the Cicero he found there. And in the 1960s, we still find similar comments. Luckily, these are judgments have changed. These judgments of Cicero's grief, I think, are based on anachronistic notions of the appropriateness of grief expression. The crucial point here is that Cicero ignores philosophical advice and goes his own way in creating a document intended for both himself and other Romans as a source of consolation. I once likened Cicero to C.S. Lewis, since both sought solace in their reading and writing. The same holds for any other writers I have mentioned, such as John Didion, who used a professional skill as a comfort zone and managed to, as it was recently said in the Sydney Herald Tribune, to write the wrongs in a way that suited them. There's actually an interesting comment also by a psychiatrist that I recently found and I've just plugged and put into the slideshow here, where he's doing an interview about the role of psychoanalysis as opposed to the role of literary books that can be done and used in grief. And he says, that I think it's only strong in its literary form, really. I think that the medicalization of it has sort of killed it. So he's sort of as someone in the business who's tending to go towards literary sources as an, a useful tool to deal with grief and distress. As examples of self-consolation, the activities of Cicero and C.S. Lewis would in modern terms be accepted as valid therapeutic tools. But Lewis had great difficulty in getting his brutally honest self-disclosure published, while Cicero had very little choice when he had no public or private context to communicate his grief along conventional lines. He did receive letters from other senators, but these contained the standard exhortations, basically saying, count your blessings in these difficult times and get on with it. What he did instead is read everything on the subject in Atticus's library, and when he considered this unhelpful and ineffective, write his own consolation to himself. But this was not all. Cicero underestimated the effect his reading and writing had. You exhort me and say others want me to hide the depth of my grief. Can I do so better than by spending all days in writing, though I do it? not to hide, but rather to soften and to heal my feelings still. If I do myself little good, I certainly keep up appearances. Perhaps he was not allowed to admit it, yet there is at least the admission that writing distracted him somewhat. And after his consolation, Cicero launched into a phase of furious writing, then concentrating on philosophy. To this phase belongs his Tuscan discussions, and I would argue that this also included a further act of skill-based therapy, namely translating Greek philosophy into Latin, a demanding technical task which had a lasting influence on the philosophical tradition in Latin. Thus Cicero, author by nature and therapist by necessity, was able to bootstrap himself out of the grief and regain social and intellectual respectability through his reading and writing. 
my second very brief example concerns the philosopher Plutarch. This is what I reminded you in the list uh, earlier. Now Plutarch, philosopher, writer and priest, was around 19 AD forced to write a letter of consolation to his wife when he heard about the death of the two-year-old's daughter. He happened to be travelling, hence the letter, and we therefore get an interesting look at a piece of writing addressed to someone else using philosophical ideas and written in a manner which also betrays something of the author's own emotional state. The letter is elegant and well-structured, but I will concentrate on one passage which sums up to me much of the strategy of Plutarch in offering solace to his wife. He leads into his advice by using some standard elements known from rhetoric. They offer exhortation and praise to cheer up the adversary. But a more important component of the strategy is to make elaborate use of good memories. This may seem a rather sentimental passage, but it is rather more than just that. Remember, it's a two-year-old daughter that died. We don't learn about the cause of death. She was the daughter you wanted after four sons. And she gave me the opportunity to give her your name. It's already a world of emotion and, and history there. There's a special savour in our affection for children at that age. It lies in the purity of the pleasure they give, the freedom of any crossness or complaint. She herself, too, had great natural goodness and gentleness of mind. Sorry, temper. Her response to affection and her generosity both gave pleasure and enabled us to perceive the human kindness in her nature. And then he goes on to say, there we are. She would ask her nurse to feed not only other babies, but the objects and toys that she had liked to play with and would generously invite them as if it were to her table, offering the good things she had and sharing her greatest pleasures with those who delighted her. Despite his use of some standard elements of consolation, Plutarch clearly succeeds in adding a personal touch, appealing to a shared experience of special significance for both parents as well as shared grief. The lively portrayal of the child is both moving and generous as a tribute to the child and the mother. Rather than assume this shared experience would be readily available for recall, he gives a striking characterization of the child, picturing her in words as a last tribute and as a lasting image for the mother to treasure. This striking passage contributes to the value of the letter as a memento of the child, to be read and reread long after her demise. Such a vivid evocation with potential emotional impact is typical of the literary technique called ekphrasis. There are other subtle techniques used in this letter, but I leave those aside to make one small point about such refined writing in relation to deeply upsetting news. Some modern commentators have accused Plutarch of insincerity because of the literary nature of the letter's composition. Instead of raw emotion, we get a finely constructed piece of writing. Does this make his emotion less genuine? I have argued elsewhere that this is not a fruitful way to approach the work. It is possible that the letter as we have it is a revised version of the original notes sent to his wife. But we would be projecting modern notions of appropriate mourning onto Plutarch if we demanded a desperate scream of agony. The letter, it can be argued, is also there for instruction of the wider circle around his wife. Let me try to conclude. I've looked at a number of similarities between antiquity and today to illustrate how grief stands out as especially fit a comparative approach across historical periods. The cases of Cicero and Plutarch allow us to explore details of ancient strategies of consolation, which prove strongly influenced by rhetorical and philosophical ideas not dissimilar to a number of modern bereavement counselling approaches. As two male aristocrats who try to cope with the loss of their daughters, they are just a small slice of the existing literature. Their strategy appeals to the universality of loss 
and becomes fruitfully fused with a kind of narrative psychotherapy, again an approach which has found new advocates in recent sociological studies of grief. Consoling himself, Cicero seems to ignore or deny philosophical advice and the role of writing for the sake. But we can see this as a cultural difference which misreads the effect of his activity. Plutarch uses writing to console his wife and himself. Both cases confirm the therapeutic role of language. Other lessons to be learned. Broadly speaking, broadly speaking, grief management has become has come a long way. But there still is no one method to apply to every individual case. This strikes at the heart of the paradox of grief and the notion of empathy. We all consider our grief both unique but also sensing that there are universal aspects to them. What does emerge is that grief is a process that requires an activity of some sort and the choice has to be a personal one. So there is good reason to investigate the issue of grief from an interdisciplinary angle. Recent shifts in classical studies focusing on emotions and modern attitudes towards death may well mean that the taboo is gradually lifting. The evidence that reading and writing clearly play a significant role in grief resolution seems to be confirmed from both ends. For the purpose of grief work, we are what we read, and we can indeed right the wrongs. Secondly, the use of modern tools has clearly improved traditional analysis of consolation writings. As a bonus, we have also found that the benefit of insight can sometimes go the other way. The consistency in grief statements and viewpoints in consolation writings suggests that humans respond in very similar ways, yet benefit from being offered words. Thirdly, as to emotion and history, I've tried to emphasize the element of universality in grief documents. But note that this is not an essentialist reading of the emotions or a claim for only one core notion of grief across time. Rather, I wish to point to the relationship between the occurrence of death and the response to it. What matters is the dynamic at the core of a culturally embedded process. Unlike technological progression, emotions are not linear and are therefore more open to comparative analysis provided we diffuse some of the risks of such an approach. In matters of the heart, the chronological gap may collapse to a certain extent. The modern vantage point does not justify, in the words of G.B. Tennyson, that, quote, self-congratulatory hum of satisfaction with our own superior knowledge, end of quote. Grief, I say, is a special case because it deals with the finality of life and confronts us with our own mortality. And finally, the similarities between grief management across time create an opportunity to explore its literary capital for the benefit of the bereaved within the context of the healing arts. And further work, of course, is really required here. So let me end, what better way to end, with a literary quotation. The writer Nabokov offered this peculiar and ambivalent thought about death, and it is both critical and consoling. Common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between two entities of darkness. Although with the two are identical twins, man as a rule views the prenatal of this with more calm than the one he is headed for. Thank you for your patience.
consider the reactions of individuals who have suffered the loss of someone dear. We recognise these experiences across the millennia. We recognise the emotions, the pain and the physical symptoms that were described so many centuries ago. Grief is timeless and as Professor Balterson has pointed out, since grief is timeless, it is worth studying how people in another era and in another world tried to cope with it. The ancient world as we've seen this evening is not, as it were, a sealed capsule. This lecture has been a fine example of how scholars whose research interests lie in the ancient world contribute to debates and discussions and research into the problems of today. So I ask you to join me in thanking Professor Balterson for making all too brief a visit to Canberra and for his very absorbing lesson, uh, lecture this evening.